Hi, everybody. This is Dr. K. I thank you for joining us, and I'm so pleased and happy to be introducing Melissa Idelson to you. She is an amazing occupational therapist. She was actually one of the first occupational therapists in Los Angeles that I really connected with. And she was one of the first people that really had me start thinking about sensory processing disorder and how everything comes together. And she's actually the occupational therapist who my children have seen. So without further ado, I want to introduce Melissa and, and let her really just tell us her story, how she ended up where she has and from there, let's learn about sensory processing. Thank you, Dr. K. So nice to be able to have a discussion with you. Mm -hmm. um, I know as parents, it's such a overwhelming feeling if our children are struggling in some ways and really hard for us to know who to go to and how to get some support and some answers. And many times what we see when kids are struggling is something in development and something in behavior. So it's just not quite right or it's more stressful or more of a struggle. So my background is I was trained obviously in Australia, as you can see here by the accent, um, but I have been a sensory integration OT for over 25 years. I've been an occupational therapist for 31 years, it's a long time. And um, I was trained in Australia and introduced to a book by Dr. Jean Ayres, uh, who is the master, was the master of sensory integration and developed sensory integration while she did her work at USC when she actually worked with children with cerebral palsy, where the focus was always on the motor system and no one really took much mm. notice of the sensory systems. So over the last 30 years as an occupational therapist, I've realized that we have to look at children as a whole. And when we look at children as a whole, we have to understand how their brain is wiring and firing and developing and how their uniqueness, their strengths and their challenges like every human being has come together. So I don't think I could separate my training as an OT, my training in sensory processing, and also my knowledge as a parent, I have two children of my own, um, to learn about how children develop and what kind of can happen that can make that journey bumpy and what mm. we can do to help. That's amazing. So you got into sensory processing way before it was even well known, because I would say it's, it's been in the last 10 years that people have even come to really understand what sensory processing disorder is, right? Yes. And I think because what happened is that sensory processing was originally connected to autism and to children with more moderate to severe special needs, but didn't necessarily enter uh, general population of what I call kids that have stuff, like adults that have stuff going on. I kind of explain to parents that I've ne never met a perfect adult. <laughs> we all have things that function efficiently and well, and we all have areas that are harder and we challenge us and stress our nervous systems out. So I would say for me, my training, obviously, I graduated 31 years ago, and I had an amazing teacher in pediatrics who introduced me to sensory processing. Then I came to America, and I did the training from USC um, out of what was the Ayers Clinic, the Jean Ayers Clinic, where she treated, and I was trained under her direct trainees, which was fascinating and fabulous, and I'm still in touch with them now. And then I had a passion for children with learning challenges, mm. children with what I call dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, dysregulation, all those areas. It basically means things are struggling to work efficiently, uh, probably because I am mildly dyslexic. So when I was introduced to this, I was like, wow, that's why my brain works this way. Because um, I think in the olden days, if it didn't work the typical way, being a learner, your IQ was questioned. Mm. Whereas now we understand that we all learn in the most different, unique ways. And we have to work out how to access our children. So about 16, 17 years ago, I opened Child Success Center in Santa Monica. And it was, it's a holistic. It's a place where we look at all things that happen that could cause a child to struggle. So the first questions when you and I consult and talk on a family is, 
what's going on, what's hard. And by what's going on and what's hard, my job is to play detective mm -hmm. and analyze from conception, from prenatal history to birth history, to first 12 months to toddler preschool years and up if we see a child much older, which we can and we do, were there any little triggers that showed us that sensory motor development or comorbidities, other things, were showing us signs that there was strain in that typical developmental process? Mm -hmm. And just like if math is not your forte, right? Maybe you're gonna be a great lawyer and you're great with languages, but math is hard. You need a coach to get through the basics. And sometimes children and families need a coach to get through the basics. And that's what we do at Child Success Center. That's awesome. That's awesome. You, you covered a lot. So I, I, I want to make sure that parents really understand all of the magical words that you put out there. Uh, why don't we start with the stuff? You said like these kids have stuff. Uh, what, what, is, what is this stuff? How does it feel like? So the kids that, that have the little things about them that ultimately you're able to really help support. Yeah. How, how does that look? Like if, if I was a parent and my kid had these issues, like if you can help our audience kind of understand how, how this all looks and feels, uh, and then maybe we can get into the wiring piece because you talked about these kids are wired differently. I, I think these are all really important pieces for families to really grasp. Um, so sure. what is this stuff? Okay. So I think from the very beginning, we need to understand that we're all genetically coded unique. And um, we all come out with pathways that are going to efficiently work some people become graphic designers and their visual system just sees things and architects and engineers and other people process language in a really easy way and they can debate their way through any argument we all come out with wiring in our brain that is going to be stronger and more efficient and sometimes we come out with wiring that isn't connecting and making those connections on their own so there's stuff that comes from that so for example, if you have a three and a half year old that has spent the last two or three months, maybe not because of COVID, but maybe preschools are open here, um, <laughs> in school, they have to be a we thinker. They have to be part of a group. Well, what does it take to be part of a group so you don't walk up and kick over your friend's tower or grab your friend by the hair because they entered your space, right? or push your friend off the slide because you can't impulse control, right? Or be really anxious and really have such a hard time separating three, four, five months into school. Mm. Those behaviors are things that challenge everyday life. Now, we all learn and grow and we, and we learn through mistakes, that's how we learn. But when those things persist, when it's not easy, when you've got a child that is having a lot of trouble transitioning from the park to the point where you have to pick them up and they're kicking, hitting, screaming, and they bite and you can't get them in their car seat. Or another piece of stuff is you've got a, a kindergartner and it's halfway through kindergarten and their attention is really struggling to keep their bottom in their seat to sit up in circle time, they're laying on the floor, they're not able to hold their pencil with a nice appropriate grasp that helps them write, they're not really interested in tabletop learning and maybe you see some delays in their um, ability to access the pre-reading and writing skills. Mm. That's kind of some mild stuff and we wait and see a lot. And I think the philosophy with children is because development occurs on a continuum and there's a range and it's confusing when you read and you look up developmental stages. I think we look for check marks, doing it by a certain date. So crawling, for example, we know that there is a lot of wiring and firing going on for a child to build those anti-gravity postures to go from here to upright. And we know that crawling, being on your hands and your knees, is a great developmental process that has to happen because it's part of a developmental continuum. So it's not okay if it doesn't happen. 
because the child's missing out on the wiring and firing in their brain of all those sensory motor pieces that we want to enrich. So a lot of parents will feel like, oh, but they got up and walked yeah. when I talk to them at four and five and six years old. And I'm like, okay, that, that was great. They adapted and they got up and they walked because they're interested to play and get up and move around. The first thing I'm going to look at in my assessment is what happened to the pelvic girdle and the shoulder girdle to build that musculature for stability, mm. to sit upright. And was there an underlying sensory motor challenge that caused that complex motor movement of crawling, which we need also for our eyes to come together. That's the distance to the ground, the distance to the book. So all those pieces, when I play detective, maybe we've got a little one that when there's so much movement around them, their visual system gets flooded because their balance system isn't that integrated yet. Huh. And they get anxious and they get into a fight flight. And maybe when someone comes into their space, when they're on the slide, they can't get their words out yet to say, stop, it's my turn. So the quick and best way to communicate is to push. So maybe we don't have a behavior problem. Maybe we have an underlying sensory motor efficiency and the behavior is the output. It's the byproduct. It's how the child stays safe and successful. So crawling is a pretty darn important uh, developmental uh, very, milestone. Very. Uh, and surprisingly, um, I found a lot of pediatricians that aren't concerned. It doesn't wave a flag when a baby is either commando crawling, you know, on their belly, scooting, pulling their hands, or they're crawling and they lift one leg and they kind of put the foot down instead of the knee down to like a tripod. Mm -hmm. um, but that's telling us that that motor network, that plan is not efficient. So there's lots of things we have to look for. And if we can go back and we can plan it, I think with a lot of these brain activity programs that have come out in the last five to 10 years, mm -hmm. they talk about reflex integration and they talk about crawling and going back in time. What they're really saying is those activities, those movement patterns mapped our brain, our right, left cross laterality, our upper body, lower body synchronicity, right? All those things. So it's not functional to have a nine year old crawling around on the floor, but there are fun sensory motor activities that we can do with our nine year olds that really help them with cross laterality and midline crossing and bilateral skills and shoulder strength. That's why we use a sensory motor gym where we have all of our equipment that we can access activities that will promote that. That's awesome. So in kind of a overly simplistic way, crawling kind of creates the foundational neural map where information then goes to the right place. So by crawling, kids are essentially activating parts of their brain that then coordinates how information ultimately gets to the right place as far as how they're able to use their body and ultimately even how they take in information like what you said through their eyes. Is that an appropriate way to kind of summarize that? Yeah, I think I sometimes explain to parents that if you were building a house, you would want to have a really solid plan and you would want to have a really solid foundation. Hmm. Because when you put the walls and the roof and then all the decorations in the house, you want it to last long, 80 yeah. plus years. So all of that childhood, I say it doesn't end at age six. Like we, we can, there's a lot of information that came out about plasticity in the brain and development and there's a time frame. and am I too late? No, you're not too late. You're always, even as an adult, I think if you can find out that, wow, I actually had difficulty. My brain had difficulty doing that. That wasn't me personally. That wasn't how smart I am. That was just kind of the gift that I was born with of how my brain, like a computer, took information in and it had some difficulty organizing that information. But then I, I find for a lot of parents when they go through this with their children, they have an aha moment of, wow, that was me as a kid. <laughs> and our self-esteem is built on how efficient and effective we felt we were. Or a lot of people used to say how smart 
you are, mm -hmm. right? And we know that smarts come in many different varieties now, um, but there's a lot of, I have children that come to me at six and seven years old and they're already saying, I'm dumb, I'm stupid. Mm. But it basically means, hey, that's hard for my brain and I need coaching. I need you to break it down. I need you to work out how I learn. Am I, how, how is my visual memory systems? How's my auditory systems working? How are my phonological systems working? And I think the beauty of a very experienced sensory integration OT is that it's our job to be holistic and you never stop learning. So mm -hmm. after 31 years, in the last couple of years, I've entered learning more about the oral structures and how tethered oral tissue or tongue ties can affect everything in the beginning. Yeah. Colic, breathing, reflux, sleep regulation, stress responses, and seeing so much comorbidity between my kids that are coming to me at four, six, eight, ten, 10, with sensory processing and learning that also may have had tethered oral tissue or a phrenectomy, they're all different words we use, cut when they were little and maybe it re-adhered and maybe their breathing is not great. They walk in and they're an open mouth posture and they yep. get colds, right? You see them as, yeah. as little ones and you see that when your mouth is open, you're filtering through your tonsils, you don't get to filter through your nose, you get lots more colds yeah. and there's lots more drooling on young kids and there's lot more, lots more teeth grinding and biting and so those behaviors need to be, there needs to be someone with a big, broad lens. I feel like it's kind of like drawing and then painting a picture. It's dot art. We had to fill in all the dots yeah. until we create a picture and that helps us do a plan. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that's part of what I love about working with you. You, you do such a great job seeing all the different pieces. And in a sense, that's kind of what this holistic minds is about is to bring together all the pieces. So parents who have no idea why their kids are struggling the way they do that they can say, Oh, I've got to go find an OT or I've got to go do this or that. And, you know, just to touch on that tongue tie, uh, our little guy who's now nine months, uh, he, he actually had a tongue tie. And we, we had to work to get it released. And it was the craziest thing. He was really having a hard time regulating. So putting him down to go to sleep was always a nightmare. He was really irritable, always tense. And when, whenever we would put down, he would automatically go into this extensor pose. And we did all of these things to try to calm him down. Tongue was released. And then literally within a week, posture changed. He was finally able to start flexing forward. We were yeah. able to put him down. And both my wife and I were like, what the heck? So it's, I know. it's crazy. And, you know, the sad part of it is it just blows my mind how many kids are out there that have this who are now 10, 12, 15, 18 and have, you know, anxiety disorder and this and learning issues. And because so we try forth. and label it, we yeah. label it with something yeah. that we see. And then they end up with a lot of psychological labeling. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. you're only labeling. I always say to parents, when you have a cake, and you have the icing and you have the decorations, all you can see is the decorations, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. you know what makes a really good cake is that the cake underneath is really good too, right? <laughs> so yeah. the same thing, you know, you said work with an OT and I think what I like parents to know is what do you ask the OT? Because not like everyone in every field, not all OTs are created equal because there's a journey in development. So, if, I, if you had come to me in my first five years as a clinician, I would have looked only at a child's motor skills because OTs look at motor skills. They look at gross motor skills, small motor, fine motor skills, handwriting skills, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's where they start. Then when I knew I needed to, to look at what came, the, what came before the motor, because if you think of a computer, what comes out of the computer is directly related to the programmer, right? The programmer yeah. programs it in yeah. and the hardware organizes it. Yeah. So what comes out, you have to go, whoa, what went in and how did it go in? So when we assess children at Child Success Center, 
we look at them from the minute they walk in the door. What is the environment like? What are the activities like that we ask them to do? So each assessment is individually tailored through our intake phone call and our intake paperwork because no two assessments are equal because children come in functionally with lots of things going on and lots of age ranges. Like this week, I assessed a nine-year-old who the mother did not want to put on ADHD or ADD medication. So we were looking at sensory processing. We were looking at the movement systems. We were looking at how when he doesn't get movement sensation and stimulation, I said to her, it's kind of his brain falls asleep. <laughs> so yes, the stimulant keeps it chemically up, but what else can we do to bring awareness for this nine-year-old for him to start to understand how his own brain works mm. and what he can do to fuel it and how he can be aware of it when it's starting to fall asleep. That's amazing. That's amazing. right. So we need to do that. And then I also, this morning I had a just 2.9 year old little boy and parents were concerned about autism. And when we saw that, and there were a lot of feeding things going on, a lot of pocketing food, a lot of sleep regulation mm -hmm. stuff, um, a, some echolalia, repeating words. There are two languages in the home. And it was very clear this little boy also didn't crawl. This boy, little boy possibly has a tongue tie, but you can't get in a child's mouth on a first visit because it takes trust. Um, but he definitely has a lot of sensory motor mm. challenges that are making joint attention and joint intention of we thinking social play really difficult. And he's also at that age where he's just starting to grow from I, you, to us. <laughs> so he's doing us with his parents, but we know that this is the time period that turn taking, sharing, with lots of conflict in between. This little boy doesn't register a sound away from him. And the first thing you need mm. to do to play with someone else is when you hear your friend knock over the tower and it crashes, the first thing we want to see when we assess kids is that they turn and they look and they reference. Because that's information coming in. Mm -hmm. Right, And then we yeah. want to see where the visual system goes. And for many reasons, kids struggle with ocular motor control or vestibular visual control and their eyes stay down. That might not be autism. That can be mm -hmm. sensory processing. So there's, I think this, it's, a, it's a lot to think about. So let, let's actually talk about that. Uh, let's, uh, because I think for a lot of parents, th this entire conversation to, the, to some extent is foreign, right? And I, I think for the most part, we take for granted that our brains just process information. Like, I, I mean, before really getting into this world, it, it never occurred to me to even question. And as a pediatrician, you know, that, that's done a lot of training, even in holistic medicine, a lot of people don't ever really stand back and question, you know, how does the brain process information from the world around it? And I can tell you in, you know, a lot of the holistic medicine world, and I just attended this, you know, integrative mental health conference online, and there was zero mention of this. So I yeah. think th there's essentially a vacuum of understanding around how does our brain and how do our bodies take in information from the world around us? And then how do we make sense of that? And really, in a sense, this, this is the entire conversation we're having, right? Yes, uh, to do. how do we help our brains efficiently take in information from the world around us and then piece it together in a way that allows us to be able to comfortably and effectively make sense of our world? Is that a good way to summarize? In a I think global? that's... Oh, that's a perfect way. And I think what's more confusing on top of that is that children are changing every day in development. Mm -hmm. So knowing what to expect, what is expected of them, that's hard for parents. They don't have, um, most of them don't have a degree in child development, right? To know, oh, that's outside the norms or they haven't spent time with lots of other children at one, two, three, four, five years old, but they know their child. So often it's the, if the second child comes along and things are much easier for the second child, then the parent realizes that that first child, wow, actually really struggled yeah. or vice versa. But when you talk about, go ahead. Uh, go, go ahead, please. Yeah. 
when you talk about processing, I agree with you. Um, it has been frustrated. I, always, I felt for the last 15 years that I was living in the altered universe and people would look at me in these strange ways. So I created visuals in the way that I would learn. So when we do our assessments at Child Success Center, I do every assessment with one of the OTs that I trained on my team. So we observe and watch and assess the child. And then I sit with the parent during that session and I bring out my trusty visuals, which I gave, I brought here cool. to show you. So if with this visual in the beginning, we tell parents understand that as like with a tree with roots, we have processing capacities that help our brain both socially and emotionally and skill wise learning. So then we go through and we understand the different processing areas with them and relate it back to their child. So for today, because you and I could talk for hours on end about this, but for today, we really are talking about sensory processing. So if we're talking about sensory processing, we show them a pyramid of if this is behavior and learning, and this is the central nervous system down here, which is breathing and right, temperature control and the basics, basic of you know, just being upright. Then the first layer has some sensory systems that we don't think about. And they are the vestibular system and the proprioceptive system first. Without those two systems, I always give parents a little anatomy lesson. And sometimes they're really excited and sometimes they look at me a little cross-eyed. <laughs> but I'm like, bear with me because I feel like if you understand the theory, then you will understand the practice of the why your child is struggling. Then you can adapt and help them at home because you understand the root of it. So our vestibular system is like the size of my thumbnail right here mm -hmm. in your inner ear. And it helps you know where you are in relation to gravity. So that sensory system feels gravity and it extends. So our babies with um, tummy time struggles, you know, the ones that mm -hmm. they really don't like it. So we, we make a comment and we say, but they just don't like it. They don't like it because it's hard for them to get all that musculature on the extension pattern working for whatever reason to get upright. Same thing with our kids that we use suspended equipment in sensory integration. That's why OTs love their toys and they love their <laughs> gyms. Um, so we have swings, swings that you can stand on, sit on, surfboard swings, swings that you can be on your tummy, swings that you can hang from because we want those semicircular canals in all different positions. So they start to get input and they start to learn how to write back to center. So one of the first things I'll do with my three, four, five, six and up kids is I'll put them on a rectangle surfboard swing and I'll see what their facial features do when they hmm. touch the swing, when they climb on it. It's novel and it's new. So they're gonna have to rely on all those internal mechanisms that balance system in your inner ear, the proprioceptive system, the joint receptors in between all the muscles and joints that feed all the way up through the base of the brain, and that visual system that judges space, and the tactile touch system, it's all over our body. <laughs> and they're gonna have to quickly and efficiently work out where they are, how to get upright, and they can hold on, and how to make it move or how to adjust to the movement. So I can look at the motor responses. What are their toes doing? Are they clenching? What are their ankles doing? Is there excessive movement? What are their hips doing? Are their knees internally rotated and fixed because they're not really using the right musculature in the lower body? Huh. Are they holding for dear life white knuckles because movement is so stressful and overwhelming? They're usually my highly anxious avoidant kids or my kids that can have big tantrums and meltdowns because their nervous system edge. gets stressed. Hmm. So yes, you can read a lot about sensory processing and sometimes the characteristics that you read about fit your child, but there are so many, this is just a basic from research on sensory processing. You can't even work this out, but there are so many types 
Yeah. And within those types, there's individualities of yes for this, but no for that. And then there's a personality in there and a relationship. So you have to create an individual plan. So if parents are looking for an OT, they need to ask questions. And they need to find out what's your training. Have you been trained in sensory processing? How do you work with children? The other approach that we use at Child Success Center is the Stanley Greenspan floor time approach. Okay. It's very child-centered, child-led. It's very much supporting the relationship. And it works really beautifully with sensory processing. So these are questions. And on our website, on Child Success Center website, we talk about the theories and the, the frames of reference that we work from. And I think it's a lot for a parent. If you're trying to scratch and you're, you've been in therapy and, you know, the child can jump now, but the other stuff hasn't come about, ask your therapist more questions about sensory processing. Yeah, because not, not all therapists, as you pointed out, know this. And this is one of the things that I have seen, that a lot of occupational therapists will focus on, you know, fine motor skills and can your child yeah. write and, you know, work on daily tasks of, you know, living and whatever else. And I've seen this so many times that kids have been in like, you know, parents are like, yeah, my kid was in two years of OT. And then I asked them like, what were, you, what were they working on? Well, they were working on handwriting and they were working on this. I'm like, did they ever put the kid on a swing or do blah, blah, blah. And they're like, no. And I'm like, okay, uh, we've got some work to do. Uh, so let me kind of recap because I, I, you, you touched on a lot of really important things. And I, I just want parents to really understand how fundamental this is. So if our brains cannot process things from our ability to understand where balance is, right? And proprioceptive is almost like where our body is in space, right? Is that in the a coordination correct? sense? Co co your coordination and kind of your orientation. Then we have our eyes and the visual input that comes in. We have sound and the sound that comes in. And uh, am I missing anything? So, so the eyes are more than just the intake. So we know that our visual system, um, it's not just about, we work closely with developmental optometrists because it's not just about making sure that the eye health is there. It's making sure that the eye function is there right. and the perception. So in our occupational therapy assessments, we will screen for tracking and convergence. So for ocular motor challenges, is what we found over the years is if children come in with any type of motor coordination, whether it's an articulation disorder, right, mm -hmm. speech articulation, or feeding, or balance, or play, or behavior, or anything like that, if the eye system, the eye muscles, they come together to hold a focal point, if the child can't easily separate eye movement from whole body movement, you're going to see them turn their whole body they're not just gonna shift and gaze. So when you turn your whole body in your head, if you sit there for a minute and do that, you'll feel a little dizzy, which mm. means your attention will be hard for you to manage to sustain. Mm. Yeah. So kids with reading, attention, learning, social, we have to screen the ocular motor system because as we said with every computer, it needs the programmer. That's the programming information. That information then comes in and it goes right back to the occipital lobe where we remember what we see. Mm -hmm. So our little firecrackers at five <sighs> years old, right? That are on the go, they're active, they're moving, or I call them like my little pinball machines. It's like a touch, avoid, <laughs> touch, avoid, touch, avoid. Maybe their memory system, their visual memory system hasn't really come on board yet. Mm. So when they go to kindergarten, there could be some delays in their handwriting. And not because necessarily there's a perceptual long-term issue, although there, couldn't be, there can be, and we look for that in our OT department, but because there's an immaturity in accessing what those eyes needed to do and what that brain needed to do to hold on to those pieces of information and repeat them back. Yeah. So there's the practice. They miss the practice. Same as with the crawling. If you miss the practice, those higher level skills then are harder. Kind of like I always tell parents it's a helix. 
Mm. So if there's a higher level skill, I'm going to go down to the lower skills to see if there was any missed opportunity. Yeah. And, and with a lot of these kids, there are multiple missed opportunities. And, yeah. You know, one of the things that's really fascinating is, you know, a lot of the things you talk about in these younger kids. So part of what I see is, you know, when all of these things are missed and now fast forward, your five-year-old is now a 15-year-old and they're labeled with anxiety disorder and ADHD and learning disability and they can't read. And every time they go to school, there, there's a set of issues. And, you know, as I'm talking about this, there's this guy that came to my mind where he was diagnosed with learning disability, anxiety disorder, depression, and he was given one other label. And, you know, we, we took care of a few things and it was really fascinating because summer came and his anxiety went over and he was fantastic. And then I saw him about a month after he started school and he's like, yeah, I, f I feel so anxious and everything is so hard and blah, blah, blah. And then we kept talking. I'm like, tell me a little bit more about, you know, what's going on. He's like, yeah, every time we have an assembly, I, I have to run to the bathroom because it's just too loud and it's just too much and I can't take it. And this poor guy had lived his entire life like this. And, you know, part of what got me to do all of this and to start Holistic Minds and so forth is, you know, it just, it boggles my mind to think how many children, young adults, teenagers, adults have this. And, you know, we labeled them with an anxiety disorder and put them on Zoloft. And we don't ever really stop to ask the question, like, why is this person suffering? And it turns out that that guy had a massive processing issue in multiple areas. So and you are you are one hundred percent correct. And over the years, what 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 helped me develop to go from the bottom up? Because you will get to see kids once you get into the roof, which is all the psychology. Mm -hmm. You can fix the tiles on the roof as much as you like. There's still always going to be a leak, right? Because mm -hmm. the foundation isn't stable. Yeah. And we have a very separate way of looking at kids. So um, we have neuropsychologists and clinical psychologists that are from the psychological, neuropsychological camp. And there are many wonderful ones that have worked with us and they straight away see that the kids have underlying sensory processing and send them. And then there's a lot of reports that I get when the kids are 12, but they had a report done when they were six and everything points to the fact that they should have seen a good holistic sensory processing OT, but because they didn't have handwriting issues, they were never sent to OT. Well, that, or I've, I've seen tons of neuropsych reports where I mean, they don't even look at the, the sensory pieces. They, don't. Like they, they, they start on, on the ground floor. They don't really start in the basement. So yeah. I went to a neuropsychological seminar um, where I was like five or 600 neuropsychs in the room. I was one of two OTs. A friend of mine took, you know, asked me to come <laughs> with her. And it was, and there was a lot. You're cutting out. Uh, research being done and they do a wonderful job and they are valuable on our team when we go about and process to get to learning uh, for for a second the connection cut out uh so i don't know if you want to repeat that last piece sure let's do it again how's the connection now uh better Hello. Okay, great. Um, so what I was talking about for families is you're on a discovery path. What's going on can help. And because it's sometimes hard to find. So the people you're going to go to are your pediatrician, especially when your children are young. And you're going to go to your school teachers. And you're probably going to go to your best friends and your neighbors. Mm-hmm. That's usually how I, I think people find resources um, and the internet, they start to read. So when children have learning challenges, or when children have emotional challenges, which we know when puberty hits, there's a lot of emotion. Those children are becoming from the caterpillars into the butterflies and 
you don't know them for a while and they don't know themselves for a while and they're trying to work out who they are in the world. If there's been any difficulties in how they process information and how they struggle to keep up with their peer group, maybe they've struggled physically in their coordination and they're not, you know, they're not playing soccer after they're six years old because it's too competitive. Or maybe they've struggled socially because they get overwhelmed because they can't think fast enough to get the words out because there's been a communication challenge or a, a processing challenge auditorily. So there's so many different reasons. Or maybe when they write in class, the teacher takes out that red pen and they, they, they may embarrass them for having messy mm. writing and it's judgmental. Um, mm. We often will send our kids when there's academic issues to a neuropsychologist or a clinical psychologist. I'm very blessed in Southern California and in the west side of Los Angeles that we have a lot of amazing specialists. But most of those amazing specialists are all out of pocket. They're, they're not in network. And the level of care for children in network, I think you've asked a lot about why is this not discussed. Um, I think there's not a lot of support for parents. If you want to get a neuropsychological assessment, you could be paying between four and eight thousand yeah, dollars. Um, if you want to go to UCLA, you're going to be on a wait list for a long time, and you're going to have probably uh, a, an intern, you know, someone who's still completing their studies, do it because that's their teaching hospital, right? And mm. they have to learn. They might miss some of these things because they haven't been out in the world and practiced and seen what it really looks like. Same thing in my field as an occupational therapist. I mentor and train and have done for the last 16 years. But a lot of therapists with productivity are thrown in. And I had a therapist interview with me who came from a children's hospital and she said, I had to walk into a 16 year old's room who overdosed and had mm. a neurological deficit and I hadn't done neuro on upper on shoulders. I didn't know what to do or I didn't know what to do in feeding or I don't know the NICU. Like OT is so specialized and we have to be a jack of all trades. So mm -hmm. I think we need to understand that children are our lifeblood. They are our future, as they say in that beautiful song. Um, and we need to honor that and put more training and more financial supports into our systems so children can get a lot of support early, not a little bit, not an hour a week. You're not going to make a big, big difference. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's really sad to see how little awareness there is around all of these really important modalities and tools that are available to help these kids. And I mean, I, I can tell you the vast majority of pediatricians, even holistic pediatricians don't know about this. And uh, there, there's a colleague of mine who, who is fairly well known. And, you know, what this colleague of mine said, like, oh, yeah, you know, we, we're over, uh, what's she saying? Oh, we're, we're over diagnosing the, the kids who are just sensitive, you know, and they we're over referring. Yeah. yeah. And, and she, I mean, she, she was basically in a flat out way saying like, yeah, you know, some of this stuff is, is not as real as, as it can be. And, you know, I just find it un unfortunate because I find, it, you know, even in, in the medical world and the holistic world, that there's a lot of dismissal of things that people don't understand. And yet yeah. at the same time, this stuff is so tangible, you know, for parents whose kids have ants in their pants and they can't sit down. And like, you know, one of the questions I ask families, which is kind of telling for me is like, can you sit, could, could your kids sit down for dinner? You know, and can they one. sit down for five or 10 minutes to eat dinner with you? And if they're like, no, every two minutes, my kid is getting up and moving and we're constantly telling them, sit down, sit down, sit down. And it's the same kid at school who has ADD and ADHD. And, you know, for your folks out there watching, like, keep in mind that what we've talked about, it, it is as relevant to your 15 year old as it is to your five year old. The, the systems like kids mature kids grow up physically they're bigger emotionally they're more mature the same wiring the same programming as melissa talked about is is still there and sadly that programming doesn't change unless you intervene to 
change some of that processing so they can experience the world a different way. And this is the part that's really unfortunate. Uh, what you touched on, you know, in terms of kids starting to develop all of these self-esteem issues, if, if you've gone your entire life and every day is a struggle, every day you're overwhelmed because your senses don't work and the way you process the information from the world around you is distorted and you, you feel dumb because in comparison to your friends, you don't understand things as easily and you can't read. You see all your friends and I see this all the time. You mm. know, the, the, these, these people are like, yeah, I'm just not that smart because, you know, my friends read so easily and I can't. And they, they internalize this and they think, well, that's just who they are and how they are. And it's really unfortunate because it's not who they are. It's not how they are. It's simply things were missed early on that caused them to become the way they are, or at least their nervous system to become the way they are. And all we have to do is just bring in new programming, right? By yeah. changing the programming, we can change their entire experience of life and give these kids a totally different perspective of, of themselves yeah. and the world. You brought up some really important points um, about there was a time where I was working closely with one of the schools here on the west side of Los Angeles. And some of the parents were going, if you, if you get that teacher, she's going to send all the kids to OT, you know. But it just so happened the year before there were quite a few kids with self-regulation and joint attention and learning challenges that needed it. So what I say to parents is your pediatrician, your teacher, they're supposed to guide you and provide you with information. What you do with that information is your personal choice as a parent. So when a parent calls me and says, my sister-in-law is a speech therapist and she recommended it or my pediatrician did or the child's grandmother was in child development or but my husband's really against it or vice versa i always say to them my job in the assessment is first and foremost to make it a happy pleasurable good experience for your child and you there's nothing stressful nothing bad so the worst that will come out of it is that you've lost a little bit of money probably not that much more than taking a big family out to dinner, okay? And a little bit of time. And the best that will come out of it is that you will learn a lot about your child. The result of that assessment may or may not be that we recommend services, support. If I don't see anything, or if I feel that it's on the verge of enrichment, but it's then a parent decision. Do you want to enrich these areas? Everything's kind of in that average zone. It's not functionally causing a big enough issue yet. Then it's a personal decision for me to give the parent information. And I say to the parent, I will provide you with that information and then you sit with it. Decide what you want to do. When I do an intake call, I spend 20 minutes with the parents and there's numerous times that I will say to them, you have not given me enough pieces of information to tell you that I definitely think you should do an assessment. Hmm. Hmm. But I'm also not there observing your child. You're giving me this information through your lens. So hmm. if you want to be sure that you didn't miss anything, we can do an evaluation. So what we did in our, we used to do a two-part evaluation. They'd come in for the first session. They'd come back for a second session. Um, but not every child needed it. And for some families, it felt like a too big a ask. Mm -hmm. And so they weren't getting that initial contact. So we changed our evaluations to a one session initial. And if after that first session initial, we need to dig deeper and we need to look more. We explain to the parent what we need to see and how we need to see that and what their options are to do that. So I feel like our job as professionals is to give parents bite-sized pieces of information and let them decide, is this something I want? Is this something I need? I've had parents call me six months, a year, two years after an initial intake call. And they said, I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure, but now this no, has gotten really hard and I need some help. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think the other way for parents to look at this is, you know, with certain things, including the senses and how we process information from the world around us, 
if the signs are there, and that's that's part of you know what I see our job with holistic minds as to to really to whatever extent possible, really help parents become clear of what the issues are. But if the issues are there and the child has what looks like ADD or anxiety or learning difficulties or whatever ultimately they're getting labeled with, you can let this just linger on, but that comes at a cost. And you know, part of like for me, when I catch this as the general pediatrician and the younger kids, I'll tell the parents like, your kid could be fine, but when they're seven or eight, they may end up getting the label and the longer we wait, the more they internalize that experience. And this is the part that really, you know, I think irks me as, as a pediatrician, when the challenge that the child has then becomes part of their self image and yeah. the, the kid who was a little bit quirky and the kid who was just, you know, they would get nervous in crowded spaces or the kid who wasn't just so good at learning, that kid then starts internalizing this. And now that becomes, well, I'm always anxious and I just don't want to socialize or I'm just dumb and I don't learn. So therefore I'm not even going to try. Or I'm not These a good the friend. That's yeah. the other one. When you when you hear from people around you because you were the kid that bite and pushed in preschool, the kids start to move away and label that person as unsafe. And then the mm -hmm. parents don't want to do play dates with that child. And then the parent of the child is like, now you be nice now. Don't bite. Don't hit anyone. Don't push. If you have a good day, you'll get a sticker at the end, you know, because they want to encourage. But that child that's biting or pushing or hitting in preschool is not necessarily doing it with a conscious, I'm going to turn around and bite Jimmy today. It's impulsive and it's a dysregulated state because like just a volcano, it just has little eruptions. And you're right. It's how we then see ourselves with a child that doesn't sit at dinner. The parents will say things like, oh my God, this is my kid that never sits still. We can't go to a meal. We can't go to a restaurant. It's always so difficult. We can't go to that restaurant because you won't stay at the table. And they don't even realize it, but as parents, we're human beings and we have our own volcano system. And when we have little explosions, they're normal. And the first thing I do with our families at Child Success Center is I welcome them as a whole because it's hard. It's hard when your four-year-old is scratching your three-year-old and they're constantly needing to be pulled off each other. Yeah. Yeah. Or that, that older child is, you know, doing something that ultimately gets them expelled or suspended, yeah. or they're the bad kid that no one wants to interact with. So that, that, one, the parents start blaming themselves because they feel, and th this is something I see actually in, in the, the parenting psychological world where it's just like, well, try this parenting style or try that parenting style. And you, you may just need to do more discipline. And you know, one of the things that I, I hope our audience can understand is this is not in the child's control. That This is not something the child intentionally wants to do. This is part of their wiring or an error in how they're wired. And it is essentially a, a, a glitch in their brain that causes them to kind of short circuit. And that short circuit is ultimately what we see as the aggressive behaviors, the impulsive behaviors, the acting out, you know, whatever strange things that are there. These are all glitches that happen. And it's like the computer screen that momentarily freezes or, you know, for a second, the picture goes weird. That's essentially what's happening inside the brains of these kids. And we don't see it. We, we blame these kids. And, you know, I, I really appreciate what you touched on because it just, it, it drives me a little crazy and it just breaks my heart every time I see one of these kids whose self-image is just completely destroyed because they genuinely believe that they are at fault for all of the things that are happening. And this was actually the reason why I started Holistic Kids. I, I had, it was a weird week. I had three kids that came back for follow-up and, you know, I had to be the one sitting there telling the eight-year-old, the six-year-old, like, this, this isn't your fault. Like you, you don't have control really over what's happening to you. And mom and dad, you guys aren't at fault because you're, you're not the sucky bad parents. This is an inherent glitch in the child system. And this is a glitch that we can fix. 
And I think you touched upon something so important is the dynamic of the interpersonal relationships in the family and parenting. So I do a lot of parenting consultation. And mm. some of that is you need to parent by dynamic relationships. So who are you? How do you process? What makes you feel good? What flips your lid? And who is your child as a system? What makes them process? What flips their lid? And that's how you then draw, well, how are we going to parent? And then how are we going to parent within the sensory profiles of that family? Hmm. So it's not, you know, I have many parents that are like, and I've had some parents who are like, I hired the most incredible parenting expert and they came and lived with me for three days. And they trained me to do this technique. And I'm like, all these techniques are great and they're good information, but did you assess how your child is processing, how the sibling is processing, how you react and process? I'm very auditorily sensitive. And I brought home from the hospital 18 and a half years ago, a little girl who I didn't realize until she was 16, who had a lip tie, who was not mm -hmm. breastfeeding well, and was snacking and falling asleep, so not eating very well, and waking up and screaming every hour or two throughout the night. And the screaming made it so difficult for me because I'm very auditorily sensitive. Mm. Mm. And it affects, at that moment, it affected my love and joy of having my child. Now, what I also didn't realize was that she was gulping air because she didn't get a good seal when she was feeding right? So she also was very gassy. So I had every colic mixture under the gassy mixture under the tongue and, and under the world. And I didn't know if I had known, wow, she's really struggling with this. How do we help her? Mm -hmm. And if someone had come in, like the wonderful lactation specialists that we, all ha we have access to now and said, wow, she's really struggling because of her oral motor structuring. And we need to teach you and her how to be a we. And we need to take care of your emotional systems and we need to let you know it's okay for you as a mom to say this is really hard and i think that's one of the things when we have kids that are glitching with stuff right and they're inconsistent but we're inconsistent as adults mm -hmm. if i don't sleep well if i'm not feeling well if i have stresses in my life i'm going to show up differently at different times yeah yeah, yeah. so just that conversation needs to start to happen amongst the parenting support systems. And that was my dog barking in the background. <laughs> it, it, Elvis. It, it's, it's so true. And, you know, these poor families are struggling so much and they really have no idea where to go. They have no idea where to turn to. And, you know, if, if in, in certain ways, it's at least, you know, when, children are labeled as autistic and it's, it's confounding to me to try to even comprehend how many children are labeled as autistic, but who are not autistic. You know, they have the that sensory process. That was the one that I issues. assessed this morning. Someone yeah, and, wanted to provide an autism label and I'm like, maybe, but we need to look, look at all the stepping stones of what that child needs to do that would equal the characteristics that could be labeled for autism. Yeah. And I mean, I dare say, and I'd love to hear from you, I dare say that, you know, probably a quarter of the kids who are right now being labeled as autistic are not autistic. They, they just, they, they have multiple systems that are going haywire and people just don't understand what's happening to these kids. So they just put autism as, as the overarching label. Would, I mean, do you yeah. have a number in your head of how many kids may actually not be autistic, but they're well, getting that? I I think the challenge is, is that pretty much all children on the autism spectrum have a comorbidity with sensory, sensory motor processing challenge, right? But some right. children with sensory motor processing challenge might have some characteristics, right? But not really enough for there to be this long-term diagnosis, which is why some people say my child was diagnosed on the spectrum, but does not have that diagnosis now. Yeah. Right? So what we really need to understand and look at from the very beginning is 
what's going on with sensory processing, sensory integration, what's going on with the organization. So for example, this morning, this nearly three-year-old has a speech and language delay, is not communicating age appropriately. So most pediatricians would have sent this child straight to a speech and language pathologist. And this child is not able to have reciprocal shared play. This mm. child has got a lot of sensory Hello, it's, it's freezing up. Hello? Melissa? Hello? Which my internet Hello? connection. Yeah, yeah. It, I'm going to change. It froze up for a second. Hello? Okay, is that better? Yes. Okay, where should we start from? Uh, you, you were talking about a three-year-old. Uh, we, we were talking about oh, autism, autism and how sensory issues. Yeah. So why, why don't I ask the question and let you kind of dive yeah, into let's that. Let's do that because you can edit this, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. We will. So uh, I, I'd love to hear from you. How, how do you see autism or autism spectrum and, you know, these sensory issues coming together. And I know there, there's this book called Almost Autism, where they talk about how sensory processing errors ultimately can, can really manifest what really looks like autism spectrum. And uh, th there was a really interesting study that I found where it was talking about, I think it was 96% or 90 plus percent of kids on the autism spectrum have the sensory processing issues. And there was another study I found just, just for uh, curiosity's sake that, that talked about how 65% of kids with ADHD have sensory processing disorders. And uh, personally, I, I found that at least 50% of kids that are labeled as ADD, especially ADHD, actually have these sensory issues. But how do you see um, autism and autism spectrum and these sensory issues coming together and you know, how many kids, if, if they had their sensory issues really addressed through good occupational therapy and sensory integration work, perhaps wouldn't be on the spectrum the way, you know, they, they'd still be quirky, you know, and uh, I, I'm a quirky individual. And I think in certain moments, if, if I was uh, uh, actually diagnosed, I'd probably fall somewhere on the Asperger's-ish kind of uh, domain. But, you know, quirkiness aside, how many people would you say could potentially lose that autism spectrum if they had all of their sensory issues addressed? I think that's a really, really good question. Um, being that for the last 30 years, most of my work along my journey, I have been able to continue digging and understanding the child in front of me. I wasn't limited to only, um, like in a school district, you're limited to what you can look at. With insurance companies, you're limited to what you can look at. Families have come to me to explore and how we can help the child. So I would say you are correct. Now, what happens is, is that as a human being, every human being all the time is sensory processing. So every single child with a diagnosis of something else is sensory processing. That's what they're doing. So are they doing it efficiently? Are they doing it effectively? Are they having functional challenges related to it? Usually the degree of that is where that we're gonna send them to OT. But most of the very typical DSM diagnostic coding for OT is going to be directly related to a functional issue for OT. Balance, coordination, handwriting, we discussed. Yeah. Self-care skills, we discussed. And then frequency and duration of OT is really never more than once or twice a week. That's kind of been what has been stated. What I have found over the years is 
by doing an assessment of how the child is processing first, then understanding their function and how these processing challenges may or may not be relating to function. And that can be socialization, right? Play skills yeah. for our young kids that might be on the spectrum, being a we thinker, perspective taking, sharing thoughts and ideas. For our older kids, it could be written expression, creative writing really deals with a lot of those things, right? As well as the physicality of just being in your body and being comfortable. What you talked about then was rhythmicity. You know, we use, we use our internal sync when we talk, mm -hmm. we think about other people, we have intention. So as a sensory integration OT, I feel that every child should be seen a neuropsychological neuropsych friend of mine says you need to see every single kid first kind of like where the base floor where the basement because when we do that what we'll do is we'll help solidify all these skills that you don't think about but you need in order to sit up and have a conversation in order to sit there and hold a pencil and copy from the board in order to go out on the ba basketball field mm. and play ball mm. with mm. your friends yeah. and yeah. play a pickup mm. game, right? And as an adult, to have executive function. So executive function is the ability to plan and sequence and program and know what's expected of you in an activity or an environment or a relationship. And then you need to make those intentions. What's the intention of their words and the act, what's going on and how do I calendar and I sequence it. We do executive function support with three and four year olds when they're having trouble playing at preschool mm. or at home and there's a lot of conflict, they're having executive function challenges. That's crazy. Mm. It's just that we don't have a platform yet to really share. People have said to me, create a video, a documentary, a book, um, Everyone wants research and it's very hard to measure our work because it has so many pieces. It's kind of like people say, do you have magic dust in your clinic? My child's been there for six weeks and all of a sudden they're on and they're connected. Yeah. Like, no, we just turned on all the connections and we helped them start to use them. And we gave them tons of positive feedback. Because yeah. if you went for a new job, would you rather your boss to be a cheerleader and a coacher or someone that made you anxious and judgmental and criticized? Yeah. You, you know, it, it's funny that you say that because I'm, I'm thinking of a guy, a patient of mine that uh, he had seen your team three years ago, three or four years ago. And at that time, he's now seven. Uh, he was having all kinds of issues, dysregulation, all over the place, you know, full blown kind of anxiety, panic attacks every time he would go into social environments, issues in preschool, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, fast forward now, and I just saw him in the mom, and he's this regulated, highly functional, just beautiful little boy with curly hair. I don't know if uh, you're remembering who yeah. I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, I, I looked at the mom and he's thriving in school. Learning is incredible. Wow. Processing is so efficient. I mean, he's just like, he's hitting on all eight cylinders and he's just going through life and he's happy and he's balanced. And, you know, I'm, I'm just getting chills just thinking about that. And I looked at the mom and I told her, I'm like, wow, how do we miss this? you know, and had we not done this work. And I think this is a way for families to look at this. You know, we spend a lot of money and time on a lot of things in life that don't matter. And like what, what, what you mentioned, this is essentially the foundation of our experience of life. And I, I, can't, I can't stress this enough. Like this is literally foundational to how our brain, your kid's brain functions. This is foundational to how a child's brain learns, processes, and ultimately sorts out information. And, you know, when I, when I looked at this mom, I told her, I'm like, wow, if, if we had missed this, like, where would he be now? Because he, he literally is a different kid. And th this is part of why I love, you know, having also my general pediatric practice, because I can see these kids grow up. And yeah. when you change your trajectory, and I'm sure you love this too, it, it, 
it's incredible. It, like there's no bigger gift. I'm sure that the family spent, you know, several thousand dollars doing this, but you know, if you spend 3000, let's say $5,000, but that $5,000 becomes an investment in your child's entire future. And I think this is the part that, that you touched on that probably escaped some of our families watching. You know, this becomes the, the piece that then creates success for the rest of their life. Executive functioning, whether you're eight or 38, is no different. You know, yeah. concentration, ability to process information from the world around you is the same. It, it, you, you experience life differently. You may end up in a little bit of a different things, but how can we change the trajectory of life for a human being at, at whatever age they are? And this, this is part of, you know, what, why I want to do all of this and why Holistic Minds is coming about to, you know, you, you talked about the platform where, well, in a way, Holistic Minds is this platform for parents everywhere around the world to start gaining awareness that these tools exist, that these modalities exist, that all of these, this understanding exists. Yeah. And by tapping into this and understanding what is the right tool to bring in for the right child, we can literally change the course of events in the child's life and the child that thought they were stupid and the child that thought they're bad and the child that can't do get along because they're constantly doing something that you know bothers another child and they're getting kicked out of the classroom because they're too whatever if we reprogram that child's system and give them the ability to finally function at the level that they deserve rather than the brains constantly short circuiting, my God, what, what, what happens to that child when they're now in their teens and then the adult in, you know, the other part of it that really disturbs me is when I see these people that do horrific things in our society where, you know, these yeah. people that just lose their mind and flip out and then cause horrible harm to, you know, the, these, the rest of society. I, I, I sit back and this is actually one of the things that constantly goes through my head. Like what happened to cause someone to be that disturbed to then ultimately act out in this way. And well, if as a pediatrician, trauma. right. I mean, if, if their pediatrician knew enough and it's not to blame anyone, but you know, if everyone had this kind of understanding and this is really what I want to do to bring this understanding and make it available to every human being on the face of this planet. But if everyone had access to this information, if everyone had access to this way of being able to see the human body in their child, how many lives can we change for the better and not just yeah. take away suffering and dysfunction, but bring this optimal experience of I life and learning? I think you, you bring up a very important point, and I think that way too, when I see um, you know, shootings and destruction like that, um, we just know that a lot of young adults in jail have learning and attention and regulation issues. Um, I think that you're touching on a point that maybe we can come back and talk about at another time. Where What we fund and what public mm. policy promotes shows us what, t tells parents what's important, right? So it's important to go in and do your checkups, it's important to meet your milestones. We don't really talk about what happens <clears throat> when something is challenging. And we also don't put it as a value system. So people buy cars and it's easy to swap your cars. I came from a country where you bought a car and you kept it for 10 years and cars were incredibly expensive. Here I'm like every one, two or three years, they're in a different car and, um, or materialistic things. No, I'd have families that could come to us and they might have be wearing beautiful clothing and beautiful jewelry and they'll complain about um, the cost of therapy. <laughs> um, the challenge we have in where we live, which is different from some other states, is that insurance reimburses at such a low level that it does not allow us to actually keep our lights on. It yeah. doesn't allow us to hire and train good staff. It 
doesn't allow our clients to do a full therapeutic hour with the family and email follow up. You know, you do a lot of concierge service. Because a child is part of a family, so when you're with working with the child for your session, there's all this other stuff around them. So the challenge I had, which was 13, 14 years ago, is I can't afford to go in that work with insurance because I couldn't keep doing my work and I couldn't keep growing and I couldn't train therapists and couldn't provide a great yeah. support. So we opened a foundation. And over those last years, I found it incredibly difficult to get people to donate to our foundation because there's not enough information of what you're creating on your portal website out there that says this is a really important thing. These children really do struggle and this is real. And if we do this, we can prevent lots of social, emotional and challenges, right, right all the way through the major traumas from the minor traumas to the major traumas. Yeah. Yeah. Self-esteem, marriages, divorces, good parenting in the future, raising healthy, well-rounded children. You know, I think it's paying it forward. We need to water the garden and watch all those flowers grow. And I've had, a, I, I've had trouble over the years really saying, why should you give to us versus children's hospital where they're doing surgery, right? And, and, and saving children's actually saving their lives. We're saving their lives too, but in a way that is really hard for people to understand. So thank you for creating this platform and for educating people that kids with stuff need our help and parents that have kids with bumps in the road need to know that those bumps are telling them something. It's not just growing out of it. Yeah. Dig underneath the bump yeah. and find yeah. out, yeah. ask questions yeah. and get yeah. help. Yeah. And, you know, sadly, uh, I think most pediatricians and most physicians and psychologists have not yet learned that those bumps are there for a reason, that, that they're not just annoying little things that are happening, that there are physical, f physiological, neurological issues that are creating these bumps. And if we can understand what that foundational piece, the basement piece, as you said, is, and really address that at that core level, then all of a sudden the bumps go away and everything becomes easier and better. I and think it's prevent play. it's preventative medicine. Yeah. It's how he it's healthy preventative versus a lot of um, school district assessments are waiting until there's a big gap for a child because mm -hmm. they don't qualify until the skills are really struggling. Yeah. So we, we have systems. Some of those systems are helping, but it's never enough because every child needs a village and a cheerleader, right? And love and attention and knowledge. But the long game is worth it if we invest. Amen. Amen. Well, this is incredible. I, I, I thank you so much. And I thank you for all this generous sharing that you have done. And, uh, you know, Hopefully together as, as a community, as a little village, uh, we, we can really change the world for countless children and just make life better for them and just help them thrive in life. I would love to. Thank you mm -hmm. for doing this. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.